Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come.
you are not, that if you get out of line, he will crush you, and that he is there to break you down, to rebuild you according to what is going to be best in light of what he deems is best. Okay, so I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm accurate, so I've never been in that context. So you guys correct me if I'm wrong or adjust me where I'm need adjustment. I'm not at the chiropractor though. Is that is that any I <laughs> is that anything like what a commander is like? Okay. Do, in in you. Okay, especially like in boot camp. Yeah. Did you ever think of your commander as kind, gracious, merciful, loving, patient? You tried not to think during that time. I get it. It's safer that way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the reason I bring this up is tonight we're going to think a little bit about adoration. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is using three metaphors by way of what it looks like to persevere in ministry. And he's using one, what the one analogy is that of a soldier, because it would have been really familiar with all of those in the first century. And, and he refers to Jesus as our commander. And so we think about adoring or delighting in or treasuring who God is and thinking about him as a commander. He's not the kind of commander that's going to crush us when we sin. He's not the kind of commander that is just waiting to pounce to correct us. He's not the kind of commander who is, is going to look you in the eye and communicate to you how, how far below him you are. He's a kind, merci merciful, gracious, loving, patient commander. So I was, I was in defensive tactics training one day with the Iowa State Patrol at Post 2. So here I am a chaplain and I'm doing defensive tactics training. So one of the defensive tactics was that, that in, in a fight as a trooper, at least this is how they taught it, you'd grab the person by the back of the neck. Alan would know a lot of these things and you'd pull them down and you'd take your knee right to their sternum. So I'm the buddy with one of the sergeants. I'm his partner. He's working on his defensive tactics. Now, this guy's a sergeant, so he's got some stripes in, this, in the state patrol. He's a sergeant in post two. And we're working at this, and I'm the one taking the beating. I mean, not too bad, but it wasn't super comfortable. And then I, I, whoever was the defensive tactics instructor says, all right, now we're going to switch around. And he looks, I, I, you know, I'm kind of like, I'm just a chaplain. That's it. There to be a help. And he's doing this to me, and we're switching it around. And he looks at me, and he's like, nope. I'm like, I didn't say anything, but I'm thinking, yeah, right, buddy. I see how this works. I'm just the dummy here. I'm just the punching bag. I'm just the, you know, so you think about that in regard to God. God is never, God is never a commander that is brutal to us or unkind or unloving. He's a sweet, gracious, merciful, and just commander that we as his servants get to faithfully serve. And so that's a little bit of adoration. So I want you to think through that, okay? How might you have been adoring God throughout this week? That was what, as I was working in 2 Timothy chapter 2. How about for you? How has the character of God been resonating in your thinking? How has it been moving you to trust and rest in him? So I gave you a few seconds to think as I was explaining that. So hopefully you've caught up with me. Who'd be willing to share? Oh, you're adoring God. I know you weren't prepared when you came. So that's why I gave you, I tried to give you a little lead way there. L let's quote Psalm 13 together. And then we'll come back to it. All right. Um, Cause I don't, I don't want to just sit there and I know I, I can tell many of you are thinking because you're looking up. All right. I do the same thing when I, that light's a good light to look at when I'm thinking. All right, it blinds me and causes me to think. So let's, let's quote together Psalm 13, and then we'll come back to this adoration. All right, Psalm 13, and we're going to make it all the way through verse 5. We have one more verse, and then we're going to work into 1 Timothy throughout the rest of the year. All right, start with a reference, end with a reference. Here we go. 
Psalm 13, 1 through 5. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. I will re rejoice in your salvation. Psalm 13, 1 through 5. But I've trusted in your mercy. Hased, that's Hased right there, mercy, steadfast or covenant love. All right, if you look at it in other versions, it's translated with different words. So we'll talk about that again here in just a minute. So how have you been adoring God? There's adoration right here in the text as well in regard to God's covenant love. Carmen. All in one, his provision, his grace, and uh, his faithfulness to his children. Recently, Amber's neighbor showed up at her door. She'd only met him once, and he handed her an envelope and said God wanted her to have it because he knew that she would need it. She, and it was just, it just overwhelms me to see how he used it, basically a total stranger to meet a need in her life. And it just, I just get overwhelmed seeing his provision, his faithfulness, and his grace towards her. His covenant love. Yeah, good. Great. Somebody else? Yes, Jennifer. Kind of one with Carmen. Um, I was able to get a book from Voices of the Martyrs on some eight different women who have suffered uh, persecution for their faith. Some are, have suffered in the past and have since died. Others have suffered and are still currently serving in danger. Um, and just reading the brutality of those that are against God. Um, Reflecting on, I think, a lot of them are satanic, satanic and demonic influence because of just the brutality that can go with the people and how they continue to love and faithfully serve God in those circumstances. And just reflecting on the verse, and I don't have it probably memorized properly, but neither height nor depth, nor principalities nor powers, and things present, nor things to come. Or was it rulers and principality? I mean, I can't. I just got lost at all. But anyway, you all, you fit it all in there. Yeah, it's not quite that order, but you get all of that plays together. I mean, we're here, yes, there's coronavirus, things present, seems terrible. Really, it's not that bad compared to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are facing death just to share the gospel. Um, some of them are facing death just to live, to get food, or they're not allowed to get food, and yet they're still faithful to the Lord, and in those trials and imprisonment, they claim that God still loves them. I thought in that verse, you know, in, in life nor death, in peace, God's cars, nothing, even their trials are separate from God, where many of them would prefer to die than to continue on in that torture and stuff, and yet, just being faithful. So just reflecting on how God's love cannot be removed from us, the salvation cannot be removed, no matter what our bodies go through, and just being grateful and thankful for that. Great, thank you. Well, we are seated like this tonight because of a bug. And it looks like that bug is up on that screen to me. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I think the verses that we're learning uh, are very appropriate. But I have trusted in your mercy. And none of us um, can get away from that bug unless God wants us to. And uh, so, you know, some of us may wind up getting sick, maybe even passing. But right now, he's been very merciful. I pulled up at the corner of 25 and Adam Street, and there was a guy to my left, had a mask on. He was in the car by himself. Now, I think he, maybe, I don't know, he had a, looked like he was on oxygen. So it's the first, time, first one I've seen in that case. And I looked in my rearview mirror, and here's a lady, and she's smoking away. And I'm thinking, how ironic. Anyway, it just, there's the bug. And a blessing, we can see the bug on that screen yeah good so in a world right now where everything is changing 
how we do church changes, how we do everything has changed, how we grocery shop has changed. And it's annoying, but God never changes. He's consistent. We can rely on that. Absolutely. We've all learned new vocabulary. Uncertain, un, a lot of unwords, you words, unprecedented. Yeah. Thanks, Ashley. And you're, is, I mean, change is coming for you too. Still getting married, right? <laughs> July 4th, right? Everybody's invited as long as they bring a gift. Bring a mask. Good. So let's quote Psalm, for my benefit, let's quote Psalm 13, 1 through 5 one more time. All right, here we go. Psalm 13, 1 through 5. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I have moved. But I have trusted in your and heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Psalm 13, 1 through 5. So we see God's covenant love on display where? Where do we see God's covenant love? His covenant love has said, that's right there in the text, but I have, I have trusted in your mercy. The ESV says steadfast love. The old King James, anybody know, have that one near them? Anybody carry any of those anymore? Okay, it's translated a few different ways, but the Hebrew term is hased, that we saw that in Ruth. It's covenant love that is not dependent on you, on your loveliness, on any action of you. It's solely dependent on God, and it's solely dependent on God continuing to be God. Covenant love. Now think about it. Think about the covenant love of God. It shows up also in Exodus 32. What did just happen right before Exodus 32? Up on the mountain, the law of God's given, covenant's made, Moses comes down. How long did it take for the covenant to be obliterated by the wretched, sinful, totally depraved Israelites that God was leading through the, through, through the wilderness? And yet... God's steadfast love, right in the text, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Right in there, God's covenant love. So, so we see it on display. Where do we see his covenant love on display here in the, in the New Testament times? Look around. You see it on display through God transforming the souls of dead sinners, bringing them to life, and the transformation evidenced in righteous actions that lead to holy character. So you see it on display. Where do you hear it? Through the word preached. Where else do you hear it? You just, you just did this. The quoting of scripture. Where else do you hear it? Yes, through the singing, all right? So we see it on display. We hear it through singing, through preaching, through conversations. So why is being here in this context tonight more full is a, better, is a way of saying that or, or more real than watching it on YouTube, okay? So some are probably watching it tonight on YouTube, and I, so I'm not stopping with this, but I, I am working at something here, so you're going to have to hang with me. Why is, why is being here, why can't, why isn't, you could, you could listen online, you can sing online with the people, uh, you can hear it preached, you can see it on display, but what's different with you being here? This is really important for us to, to recognize. You get, to, say that again, Jennifer. Okay, you get to serve. The function is essential in the covenant love of God actually working itself out. 
So the function, so we think about, Alan brought up, and, and, and there's some, you know, Ashley did as well, we're thinking about the virus. And uh, so in that, in that realm of, okay, um, do I believe the news media? Oh, that's a tricky question. I mean, so I was recounting to someone the other day, Governor Pence, or not Governor, I think he used to be a governor, uh, Vice President Pence. So he was in Des Moines and he was moving some boxes and supposedly he was moving some boxes that were empty so that he could, for the camera, look like he was actually doing something. I didn't even read the whole article. And then, so I read it and like he was just doing it for show. And then I was telling that to somebody and said, oh yeah, that was proven. They, the, the media made that up completely. I'm like, what? Yeah, they just lied about it. Okay. <laughs> So, I mean, what, what do you believe here? All right, so, so we have, on one end, we have, well, this is irrelevant. It's all a hoax. Put it on the plate and spin it however you can so it's going to bring, uh, it's going to be advantageous for you, okay? Whoever you are, I don't know, okay? So that end of the spectrum, this end of the spectrum over here where, where you know, there's three ways I think over here you can, and this is too simplistic, but three ways over here. You can be concerned and be careful. And I think that's appropriate. I mean, there are people that have underlying health issues. I saw the guy had oxygen running up to his nose, I think, had a mask on. I think that guy really needs to be careful. We have some people in our church that have diabetes. And, and according to the statistics, diabetes is one of those underlying health issues. It's, it's really significant. So being careful and, and, and uh, um, also being concerned. But maybe over here as well is, is this, and Psalm 27 helped us this morning. I can be driven by fear. I mean, man, there's, when I know that death is on the prowl, I want to run. Well, a good, for, a good thing for us to remember is this. What is the mortality rate of, for humanity? It's 100%. The mortality rate for humanity is 100%. According to God's time. And his covenant love is going to be realized as he leads in my life in protecting, providing, caring, and completing his plan for me. He has my days numbered. So I must not be driven by fear, but even in Psalm 13, I must look to his covenant love. And then, and, and Pastor Dave and I have heard this in very, at various times over here, uh, and even this has maybe been true of us at times. So when we weren't meeting and we were just kind of doing some things online, there's kind of a convenience that goes on when you don't have to gather, isn't there? Isn't there a convenience that goes on when you don't have to gather? Okay, let's not lie to each other, all right? Let's be honest. Yeah, I mean, there's a convenience to that. I mean, man, I can, I can watch things on YouTube. I don't even have to dress up. I mean, I... And I can watch it when it works in my schedule because maybe I got these other things I got to get done and, and those types of things. So, so there's even an element of convenience. And so now we have maybe developed potentially some habits where, you know, it's kind of convenient to just fit into what we've been doing where we must remember that God's covenant love shows itself in function. It shows itself in function. So as I lead us in prayer here, that's all I'm going to pray for. And, and we give grace and mercy to, where, to each other wherever we're at on that spectrum. And just help one another. Because it's really easy to say, well, you're not handling things the way that I think you should handle them. Fix it. Or stop. Or correct it. And that's really not helpful. But it is good to ask questions. And it's good to pray with. And it's good to evidence kindness. And it's, it, it, it's good to remind one another that the only way that we can actually be a body is in function with one another. So let's ask God to lead us in that. Lord, we, we praise you. We're just so thankful. It's, it's, uh, it's unprecedented times. In one sense, but in another sense, uh, even as Pastor Dave recounted history this morning, uh, these things have come in the past and they've gone. And so in some sense, it will come and go, but in another sense, we'll be affected by it and things will change. And even as Ashley recounted in, in, in our adoration of you, you do not 
change. Your covenant love, secured through the person and work of Jesus Christ, is certain and complete and will be brought to completion at your return. And so in the meantime, as, as we walk through life, we recognize we don't do that alone. We don't slug this life out alone. We, we do it in the context of one another because your covenant love shows up, shows on dis, it's on display in, in the life of the church and ultimately in the function of one another together. So we love to see it on display. We love to hear it preached and sung and recounted in word, but ultimately the fruition of it in our function with one another. What a joy, what a blessing, what a privilege. So as we navigate even these next several weeks and, and, and uh, as Lord willing, the, the virus continues to decline and, and uh, uh, people are able to to understand where the trends are headed. And, and I, I just pray that, that you would lead us to function well together, that this body would be healthy, and ultimately that, that your glory would be displayed, that the covenant love of God would be the fuel that moves us in our love and our kindness and our mercy to one another to please our commander. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're here last Sunday evening on our message from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, we mentioned the trumpet of God, and Mary Ellen has uh, brought her uh, dad's 
a shofar up here, and uh, you can come up and take a look at it after the service. I would ask that you would not pick it up or wave it around, and with the coronavirus, if you would refrain from playing it. Um, and uh, um, if, if, we, if we hadn't been under virus times, I think I would be uh, calling everybody to worship right now. Um, but um, being that we're under the virus and I don't necessarily want to send them home with my germs. And it's been a while since my chops have warmed up to my trombone uh, in a while. So um, I think I'll leave it to just be observed. But that was the, uh, that was the uh, call to worship. That was the call to assembly. That was the call to gathering. And that's the same word in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, that shows up there in First Thessalonians chapter 4 when we see the trumpet of God. And it's that calling together that assembly. And then this morning, as we looked at First Thessalonians chapter 5, in the beginning of First Thessalonians chapter 5, we examined there that, uh, again, this, uh, there's no element of fear that needs to be there when it comes to this day of the Lord. Now, I have to send out a very, very big apology to Pastor Dan and to Jeannie. If you notice this morning, our song service our corporate prayer time, our scripture reading, it all went with the passage that we're preaching tonight. Um, and I failed to communicate to them well enough that I had split some things down a little bit smaller bite-sized pieces. And they had a beautiful worship service planned for this passage. Um, and, and so some of you were like, nothing we sang about, nothing we prayed about, nothing we read scripture about had anything to do with what you talked about. And that was because the, what they had, they thought we were going to be here, and that was my fault. And so um, I'll take one on the chin uh, in that aspect. But tonight we're going to talk about the difference between night and day, um, children of the day and children of the night. Um, I don't know if you remember, Pastor Dan, your brother Ken got married. The night before his wedding, uh, we took Ken out on a bachelor gallivanting thing. We literally put a ball and chain around the guy's ankle and made him carry around a ball and chain. I cannot believe we did that. Um, like, like all of us were anticipating marriage and we embarrassed this guy making him carry a ball and chain around the entire night. We were on our way back to the hotel that evening and it was dark and it was late. What we did not know is the girls had ransacked our hotel rooms um, uh, while we were out. <laughs> And while we were driving back, there was a, a man walking down the side of the road in the darkest of dark black cloaks. And I saw him on the side of the road and we rolled down the windows and everybody yelled at the same time at this guy that was walking down the side of the road um, in, uh, what is it, Calumet, Indiana. It's not exactly the armpit of uh, of the United States and Gary, but it's pretty close. <laughs> um, and this guy turned and he looked at us and he was just pale white. And he has had the creepiest face as um, we thought we were going to scare him. Ah! And he turned and looked at us and everybody went back to the hotel just completely freaked out. You know, um, we were just like, did you see that guy? Oh my goodness, a night walker, a night walker, you know, and, um, and, and all the rest came out of our mouths as we saw this guy just walking down the road in his dark cloak and his pale white face. Well, you are you a day walker or a night walker? <laughs> you said, David, I never have walked down the side of the road in a dark cloak ever before in my entire life. I don't paint my face pale and people don't scream at me in the middle of the night. Um, well, there is supposed to be a distinction. And when Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, he has answered their question about those who have died. He's answered their questions about the rapture. He's answered their questions about the day of the Lord, that that's nothing that needs to be feared. And he wants them to understand that there needs to be a clear distinction between them and the world that's around them. And that distinction comes out in several different ways. Remember, this, this church was a, a church that um, that was planted by the Apostle Paul three weeks, and then the Apostle Paul was gone. And if you have the notes that were in your bulletin there, um, one little typo that you need to correct there, it's God's great desire uh, is for there to be a clear distinction between believers and unbelievers. Now, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, and uh, that whole phrase, uh, uh, we're of the world, but not, we're in the world, but not of the world, <laughs> was just like thrown out the window in the late 80s, early 90s, okay? 
It was, um, if we're going to cross over, we're going to take the cross over. And um, I even have to confess that there was probably some genre of quote-unquote Christian music that I had no business listening to, but you can probably not tell much of a difference between it and the uh, world that was around there. And I don't need to start preaching about Striper, but um, if you were one that followed the bumblebees in the 80s, um, you just know this was just not a group that was in any way presenting Christ. Um, and there needs to be a distinction. And there, that distinction is very real. And, and when Paul's writing to the Thessalonians, he is, uh, in a sense, kind of exp- debunking their, their apathy and debunking their just passivity and saying, look, you have to make sure that this distinction is visible and that this distinction is real. He, he gives them three areas of their lives that they are distinct, where believers and unbelievers are distinct. And we are, we're not going to compare apples and oranges here, uh, or apples and apples. We're going to compare apples and oranges. But we're talking about day and we're talking about night and the difference that is there. Let's look at the first one here. This, there's to be a distinction in their nature. There's to be a distinction in their nature. The nature of believers and unbelievers is completely different. Look at verses 4 and 5 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But you, remember, he had just referenced back in verse number 3 that the day of the Lord is for them. Okay? But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day that's the day of the lord capital d should not overtake you as a thief there's a distinction in nature between a believer and an unbeliever a believer needs to live in fear of this day of the lord and uh, and a believer doesn't need to live in fear of the day of the lord an unbeliever does need to live in fear of this god of god's coming judgment verse number five for you are sons Uh, all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. You see the distinctions that are made here. And I don't know if you want to draw a little chart there in the uh, blank space that I gave you there in your notes. Um, But you have believers and you have unbelievers. Now let's just look at uh, believers here for just a second. You see that verse number four explains that believers are not overtaken by the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord isn't something that we have to fear. The the day of the Lord doesn't come as a thief in the night for believers. Believers are distinguished in verse number five as sons of the light, as sons of the day. And that distinction in nature is different from unbelievers. You see the unbelievers, they are overtaken by the day of the Lord. It does come to them as a thief in the night. And they are To put the same phrase that goes with believers, they are sons of the night. They are sons of the darkness. And so there's a clear distinction when it comes to believers and unbelievers purely by nature. Now, this has a little bit to do with the doctrine of anthropology in one of our 11 doctrines there, if you count patronology as a doctrine, doctrine of God the Father. Um, 10 if you take that one out. Um, and, uh, and that doctrine of anthropology has to do with the, the, the makeup of mankind. And we are um, material beings and immaterial beings. And we have a sin nature and we are given a new nature at the time of redemption. And that, that change and that transformation that takes place inside the believer is a life that was once lived by the flesh, but now is lived by the Spirit who has come to indwell us. And if you do some reading about the doctrine of anthropology, you'll see that some will say that that new nature is actually, some actually believe that it's the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 gives you three verses there to, to show you once again the, the proof of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that makes a transition in the life of a believer. That brings a transformation in the life of a believer. And that our classification is no longer darkness, but now we are children of light. And we live as children of light. So there's a distinction in our nature. Number two, there is a distinction in our behavior. We don't uh, do the things that we used to do by way of our old sinful nature, and we uh, act differently in light of it. Okay? Okay. 
And again here, look at verses uh, 6 through 8 to see what Paul brings to light here in this aspect of our behavior. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let those who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love and the helmet of the hope of salvation. So you see the distinction that's made here. Let's start with believers here, okay? Believers are not sleeping, okay? Now, that does not mean that you don't take the necessary rest at night. Three of you are yawning right now, okay? Um, that was not meant to trigger that, okay? All right? The, 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 the time of sleeping, there is a necessity time to sleep as a, um, as a believer and as a human being. In fact, I read that one of the things that puts you at risk by way of the coronavirus is not getting enough sleep. And so hopefully we've all gotten enough sleep so we're not at, at risk. And, and, uh, but uh, it's not talking about physical sleep. It's talking about the aspect of being apathetic or the idea of being what, what is engaged really when you sleep. I mean, what is willful in the time when you sleep? Not a whole lot, is there? That is willful. And so it's, it's kind of the counteractive to that. And we are to be people who are, who are watching. And certainly that has a, a relation to the coming of the Lord. And, and there's passages that talk about that. But really it's being more watchful to the, the world that is around us. And how our world is responding to what they believe to be truth. To be alert to what is around us. To be alert to our surroundings. And then the, uh, the aspect there of sobriety or being sober and this word is, is used here in a, in, a, in a play against drunkenness. And, and certainly there is an aspect of where believers who abstain from alcohol can live a life of sobriety, can live a life that is sober. But when the Bible uses the word sober, it simply means the word serious. I think, I think it's, it's just talking about the word serious and being serious. Um, I don't know if, uh, I, hope, I hope none of you make a regular habit of watching Saturday Night Live, but Apparently, last night on Saturday Night Live, they had a whole sketch about church services that are on Zoom. And they had this whole big running uh, kind of rant uh, and comedy sketch that was basically poking fun of churches who were having church services by way of Zoom. And um, I, I, would, I don't suggest you go watch it. I don't suggest you go look it up on YouTube. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just trying to help you understand that our world... If you think they haven't been watching us, I mean, they're already watching us to the point in place where they're writing sketches to what? Make fun of what some churches have been doing. And this idea of sobriety here is, the idea of being sober here is more the idea of being serious. We take serious matters serious, and we don't make a joke of serious matters. Um, and that's why even when I told you just a moment ago, I mean, when we dressed Ken up like a slave and put a ball and chain around his, his, his ankle and dragged him all around town, and while we had a lot of fun with him, I, I go back in my mind and I think to myself, we were, this man was a, the evening before he was actually going to be wed, the evening before he was actually going to get married. Uh, and as beautiful as marriage is, we treated him with such spite. I mean, we just, we treated him terrible. And it's one of those things we take serious matters serious. Next step for the believers. Sobriety of this idea of being sober is equal to, first part of verse number eight, let us then who are of the day, what those who are of the day are sober in the day. Okay. And then he gives a little bit of a picture over to Ephesians chapter six. And those who are believers, what do we do? We put on the breastplate of faith, love, and the helmet of the hope of salvation. So we arm ourselves with this spiritual armor. What about unbelievers? If that's what believers are by way of behavior, what are unbelievers? Well, unbelievers are classified as sleeping, <laughs> um, not alert to what is around them. And they're not watching to be alert to what is around them. I mean, Pastor Jane asked a great question here just a moment ago. Do you believe the media? <laughs> and you gave a yes and you gave a no in your mind, didn't you? <laughs> See, we choose who we want to believe, don't we? 
You're like, well, if it came from Fox News, I, I guess I'll t- 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 put a little bit more stock into it. But if it came from CNN, absolutely not. You know, we, we filter through in our mind who we're going to believe. Some of you are like, hey, Dave, Fox News isn't really reliable either. You know, you got to you watch Newsmax TV. That's where it's at. Or, you know, it has to come from the words of Rush Limbaugh. Then, then you can really trust it or something like that. Okay. Well, you know what? Everybody's flawed. Everybody's flawed. And our world is not, although right now it looks like our world is taking stock of everything that's around us and the world is trying to get as much information as they can of everything that's around us. They don't take stock of what's around them when it comes to a spiritual sense of what God is doing. And the world around us definitely would not be marked as a being a world that is serious or takes serious matters seriously. I mean, folks, you know that uh, it, it's just a growing trend within our culture. What we, what we can bring ourselves to laugh at, we can bring ourselves to accept. And so all the sitcoms of the 90s, what did they do? They poked fun at gays and lesbians. And then what happened in the early 2000s? We accepted it. We accepted it. It just became part of our, part of our makeup. There's an article on MSN's homepage yesterday that said, I have gone through transgender surgery and now I don't know what to do on Mother's Day. I mean, it's a, one of the top articles at the top of MSN's homepage. Somebody who's gone through a, a, a transgender sex change and now they don't know what to do on Mother's Day. How about honor your mother? <laughs> How about honor your mother? I mean, I just, I, what, what, is, what is that? have to be, why does that have to be such a quandary when it comes to Mother's Day? See, our world is not serious. And they sleep because they sleep at night. They're classified as sleeping because they're people of the night. And when they get drunk, typically they get drunk at night. Now, I know that's not necessarily the case any longer. Um, I was listening to a pastor friend of mine who was on an online um, a podcast. And he has a, a guy that he's been working with who's been sober for three years lost his job um, by way of uh, the layoffs and the shutdowns and the mandatory furloughs by way of the, uh, of the coronavirus. He's been sober for three years and he relapsed the night before this podcast and, uh, and just went out and, and got as much alcohol as he could get and got as much alcohol as he could get. And in one night tried to drown all of his sorrows away. How many of his sorrows were there the next morning? Every single one of them. Every single one of them. When this world parades that, that mentality, it's a paraded mentality that comes by way of their living in the night. And, you know, I know we uh, spent how much time earlier this year talking about Christian and alcohol, but I'm just telling you, this is one of those passages that helps us see that there should be a distinction, a clear distinction in believers. And for us to take a, a mentality and say, look, we can do whatever the world does around us we just have to do it in a different way. We just have to do it in a sanctified way. I think you have a hard time making that distinction that Paul's making here. He's saying, look, we should be different. We should be completely different and distinct by way of our behaviors. I need to hurry here. Number three, we are distinct by way of our destiny. Our destiny. Um, the world uh, in, in its darkness is heading to an eternity without God. We who are the ones that are the children of God, we are distinct in that we're heading to a place called heaven to be with God. But we're not just talking about destiny and when it comes to just that eternal basis. Look at verses 9 through 11 here if you can. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. And whether we wake or sleep, whether we're alive or whether we die, remember every time Paul refers to the death of a believer, he uses a soft term. He refers to it as sleep, not taking a nap, not conking out and getting your Z's. That we should live together, what? With him. Jesus said when John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you on myself that where I am there, you will be also. Verse number 11, therefore comfort each other and edify each other just as you are also doing. Keep doing these things. These things that have come from what? That you truly are born again. That you truly are redeemed. Just a comparison here real quick. Believers are not appointed to wrath, but they're what? Appointed to salvation. You say, Dave, I thought salvation was something of the past. Well, 
our salvation is, is definitely a faith decision of repentance and faith in the past, but isn't it also a progressive decision? We are saved from the power of sin, and we are, gradu- we are saved from the, we're gradually being saved from the power of sin, and one day we will be saved from what? The presence of sin? I mean, there's a progressive nature to salvation, and we haven't been appointed to what? That day of the Lord wrath judgment from God but to see the completion of our salvation. Um, We have what? We are servants of the living for God or from the living God. Uh, And believers are believers who live for God, verse number 10. And believers have their lives characterized by comforting one another and edifying one another. And there is a sense at the end of verse number 11 where that should be in continuance. And of course, you remember when I told you (laughs) that I mixed up 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, and 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 11, with the ladies group at Calvary Baptist Church of Mount Pleasant. They wanted, we want, therefore, comfort one another and edify one another, just as you are also doing. We want that on our poster, and I put 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 11, which says uh, that you aspire to lead a quiet life, mind your own business, and work with your hands, as just as I commanded you. Um, and, um, and the ladies came to us and said, change it, we are, you know, and I, I was like a stealthy little message toward the ladies at the church, you know, um, they wanted this verse. We want to comfort one another. We want to encourage one another. We want to keep doing that. What about unbelievers? Well, they're appointed unto wrath. There is no rescue. They've denied Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again. They don't have salvation. And what are they characterized as? Verse number 10, they're characterized as living for themselves. So there is no comfort and there is no edification. And so we've seen a difference between those who are of the day and those who are of the night. The people of the day and the people of the night. And there's a difference in nature. There's a difference in uh, the aspect of uh, their behavior. And there's a difference in their destiny. And so may that difference be seen in our lives as we remain on target in our faith uh, even this next week. And uh, we're going to continue into an interesting section of 1 Thessalonians 5 here in the uh, coming days. These are short little statements, power pack statements uh, of the Apostle Paul. And so hopefully you'll continue to track with us as we continue for, through 1 Thessalonians. And uh, for tonight, remember that we can let the difference be seen. We can let the difference be known um, because God has rescued us through the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you again for these truths. Thank you for the opportunity to rejoice in them. And Lord, for the opportunity we have to live them out, um, that we would be this week people of the day, that we would be this week people who are comfort to one another and edifying one another and continuing to do just that, that we would live because Christ has rescued us from the domain of sin and translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. And we thank you and praise you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Mike.
tonight, and she's putting together a, a whole slide presentation uh, to send to him. Don't forget, the bulletin does say Ashley Pearson's uh, bridal shower is this Saturday, and we've, we're going to postpone that to another time when we can shower more properly. Um, and um, uh, that didn't sound right, did it? Um, anyway, we can do a, do a bridal shower. And, and, um, and so we're looking forward to that opportunity as well. So make sure you take note of that. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on Wednesday and then next Sunday morning as we can have the opportunity to gather again. Uh, Lord bless you as you go. Have a great night and we'll look forward to talking to you here soon. Kids, if you want to look at the shofar, you can come up and take a look at that. But as soon as uh, everybody's gotten a good look, I'll turn it over to Mary Ellen and she can play a tune on the way home. <laughs>